God, we thank you for your amazing grace, Lord God. There's nothing we can do apart from the, by your grace, Lord God. So we thank you for that, Lord God. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, and anoint this Bible teaching time, Lord God. Change our lives, Lord God, and we want you to do a work. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. amen. Hey, let's give the worship team a hand. Isn't that awesome? And also, I'd like you to keep Daniel and his family in prayer. Daniel retired from the Marine Corps, went back into the Army as a United States Army chaplain. And in August, is that what it is? Or it's July? He will find out where he's going to be serving, but Daniel's the whole package. We thank the Lord for Daniel. And we're going we're gonna to miss him. And then also, Nathan and Angie Rutledge are moving to Livingston, Montana to help start a church in Livingston, Montana. He's retiring from the Marine Corps. I, I truly don't know anywhere that sends out more people than uh, Joshua Springs does. It is a phenomenal blessing. And Mike Yost was one of those people that uh, was raised up here, went to Bible College, and the Lord sent him not only to the Philippines, but now to Idaho, where a great work has been done. And uh, just beginning, they have this entire school that they got. Can you imagine buying an entire school that's got a gym, all the classrooms, everything, and an entire city block in a town that was very sleepy, very, very small. Of all the cities in that area, they was the smallest one. They're building 500 homes there. So I think they've only just begun to see what God's going to do. Let's welcome Mike Yost. Good morning, gentlemen. You rest well? Yeah, sweet. 
Uh, I got to thank uh, Calvary Bible Institute and uh, the way we've been taken care of here. What an amazing thing that God has got over there. And uh, boy, I, I, we've just rested and been blessed and had such sweet fellowship and such good food and, and uh, all of those things going around. I'm having fun. I'm having a really great time with you, renewing acquaintances, making new acquaintances, and just looking at what God is doing this weekend amongst us. And I am having fun, but you know, the, my favorite part about this whole thing is watching as we look at Jesus and he starts really, like David would say, breaking the teeth of the enemy, right? Storming the gates of hell, becoming the devil's worst nightmare. And gentlemen, you know, it is a battlefield. We talked about that last night, right? That was spiritual war- warfare. We don't wrestle against what? Flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we looked at and we pulled back the curtain and we saw this invisible warfare that circles around us. Well, this morning, we're going to take another look at the battlefield. And I want to just take us back to start in the beginning where we were in Romans chapter 8. I'm just going to read quickly and I'm going to move into this morning's message. But it has to do with the strategy and the tactics that we take to the battlefield. And in Romans, in chapter 8, we read at verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the victory that was won on our behalf. That, Lord, we can stand assured that we will weather this storm. That through you and the power of your Holy Spirit, we become the storm. Your church, your body on earth, the devil's worst nightmare. And we aim, Lord Jesus, to stand up and to show ourselves strong for you by the grace that you pour into our lives. And so I pray for every one of us gathered here today that we would step up to the plate and learn from you how it is that we can find victory in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. I want to take you in the scriptures through a little tour through the life of one of the great warriors, one of the great conquerors in the Bible. We meet him as a young man named Joshua. Joshua. That name is Yeshua. He is a a type, a picture, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, our conquering king. And in the life of Joshua, we can learn a lot of lessons from the battlefield, a lot of strategy as to how it is that we can go about confronting the enemy and confronting this darkness that we have in the world and that we can come out on top. We learn this through Joshua. So I'm going to start in Exodus chapter 17. This is where we first meet Joshua. We read in verse 8 of chapter 17, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, first time we meet him, Choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. 
and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek, his people, with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Some great lessons for us in the beginning of this series of of vignettes, pictures that we see in the life of a young man named Joshua. For starters, we see him in obedience to Moses, his mentor, his leader. And I pray that we, going on to the battlefield, recognize that we don't go out on to the battlefield alone. But we go out in groups, right? We go out together. We go out in fellowship. None of us alone can stand against the world. None of us can stand alone against the devil. None of us can stand alone against Amalek. Amalek, this nation, is always a picture or a type of the flesh in the Bible. Those passions, those desires, that selfish lust that wars within us. And we can't stand up to that battlefield. We can't stand up to the devil. We can't stand up to the world's temptations on our own. We need a group of people. We need mentors. We need people speaking into our lives. And this is part of the strategy for going out on the battlefield. We fight under God's colors. Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. I'm fighting in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm fighting in the name of all that is good and holy. And I need to get up and get there and, and, and get engaged with the battlefield. And we fight on a team. I'm mindful of a, a story of a city slicker come to Idaho. And he's out cruising along the back roads, checking out the farming. And uh, as he's going along a farmer's field, he gets stuck in the mud. The farmer's out in the field. He's plowing the field with his plow horse. And uh, he looks over and he sees the city slicker, so he makes his way back over to where the city slicker is, recognizes that he's stuck in the mud, so he unharnesses his plow horse and hooks it up to the vehicle. His plow horse's name is Buster. And uh, the man in the, the car says, I really appreciate this. And he goes, well, that's okay, but you can thank Buster. He's the one that's going to do the heavy lifting here. And so he harnesses Buster up and he says, Nelly! Nothing happens. City slicker scratching his head. The farmer says, Go, Samson! Nothing happens. Farmer says again, Go, Rosie! Nothing happens. Finally, the farmer says, Go, Buster! And Buster just popped that car right out of the ditch. The city slicker scratches his head and he says, Why? Why, if the horse's name is Buster, did you holler out Nellie and uh, Samson and Rosie? And he goes, well, you see, Buster's blind. And if I didn't call all these other names, he'd think he was pulling a loan and wouldn't do anything. (laughs) Any Busters in the room? Do you not know that we need to pull together? We need to be in Harmony. We need to be in unity. We need to be working as a unit. Okay? That's basic battlefield tactics and strategy. Right? We got some soldiers in the room. We got some Marines in the room. That's how it works. Well, let's go over to the book of Numbers. Next lesson in Joshua's life that I want to highlight here. In Numbers chapter 14, you know the story that they got up to the edge of the promised land and they set spies into the land. They went into the land. They saw, in fact, indeed, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, just like God promised it would be. They came back. Ten spies give a bad report. In Numbers 14 chapter 6, we read, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. 
If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and we give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. <laughs> Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And the congregation said, stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before the children of Israel. Gentlemen, do understand that we battle under the banner of our victorious king. We battle as a team. But you've got to understand, not everybody's going to be on our team. And even amongst those people that we walk with, these are the children of Israel. Even among those people in the church, not everybody's going to be on the same page with you, gentlemen. You go into the enemy's camp and you purpose to take back that which he's stolen from you. And there's going to be some people say, I wouldn't do that if I were you. You don't want to be picking a fight with the enemy. Gentlemen, be very sure. Satan can eat your lunch. But as a team, under the banner of God, for the glory of God, by the tactics of God, with the weapons of God, you are victorious. You already own it. God gave it to you. It's yours. If somebody's stolen your innocence, if somebody's stolen your hope, if somebody's stolen your joy, if some kind of sin that's dogging you and just dragging you, maybe you've had it since boyhood, maybe since you just were snooping around in your parents' bedroom and you saw those stack of Playboys for the first time, and ever since then, this thing dogs you. Stand up, gentlemen, under the banner of God, and get a team of men, and go back and steal back from the enemy that innocence, and that hope, and that joy, that purpose that you were created for. Lesson from Joshua. Spy out the promised land, and get your eyes on the prize, right? When we go hunting, I, I, I bless now in, in uh, Idaho, I've got some dear friends that are teaching me, you know, how to bag some big game, and I've been blessed now to fill a tag several years in a row. And one of the things that's just absolutely, it's like a no-brainer, but you do understand that when you lay your rifle down and you look through that scope, what do you have to do to hit what you're aiming at? You've got to put the crosshairs on the target, right? You don't put the crosshairs on the target, there ain't going to be no barbecue, you, it's just, it's simple, right? It's really simple. But gentlemen, in our life, unless we put the cross of Jesus Christ on the target that we're aiming for, no lunch. Okay? And so we need to get serious about this. We need to see the promise that God has laid out to us. Go in, spy out the land, and see that God has created you for a purpose. He's got a plan for your life. You were created in the image of God. And he has created you for beautiful works that you should walk in them. But it's going to start by putting the cross of Jesus Christ and laying it over that target and pulling the trigger. Okay? Go further into the life of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Mon, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people, to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given it to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river of the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Gentlemen, there comes a time where it's time to grow up. Pull up your big boy britches. Yeah, there's a time when you're a young Christian and you're walking and you're surrounded by people that are just you know, praying for you and teaching you and training you up. But gentlemen, there has to come a day when you grow up. There has to come a day when you take the baton and you say, this is my battle. I'm fighting this. I'm going to take this. I'm going to hold on and claim the promises of God. And you begin to move into that position in life where you're no longer just mentored, but you are mentoring others. You are no longer just a disciple. You are now discipling 
others. And you are helping other men with the battle from your years of experience on the field. Taking that victory which God has given you and then encouraging others to come alongside. It's one of the strategies. Do not fear, God says in verse 6. Be strong in a good carriage. For this people shall I divide to you as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only, I like that. I love it when God says only. I like it when God says one thing. I like it when God breaks it down and makes it simple for me. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left that you may prosper in wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Gentlemen, this is a command. God has commanded you. God has commanded me Man up. Cowboy up. Be strong. Be, it's a command. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's not some kind of, oh, well, if you do this, it's going to help. That's just straight up what we need to do, gentlemen. We need to stand up. We need to be strong. We were created to be strong. God intends us to be strong. We're created in the very image of God. And there's no place in this for wimping out. Now, I know the battles are real. We just read about that in Romans, right? This business of pestilence and famine and nakedness and the sword, these aren't invisible warfare. Those are real things. These are real battles. We deal with real issues in our life, in the workplace, in our family, even sometimes in the church, Things that wound us, things that attack us, things that try to drag us down. And they're not just invisible. They're real day-to-day -day issues that need to be confronted and overcome. Yet, in all things, we are what? We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so, do not fear, right? Be strong. Be courageous, God says. And he says, do not let the words of this law depart from your mouth. Gentlemen, there is no substitute. Let me help explain that clearer. Gentlemen, there is no substitute. <laughs> I don't know if I can make it any clearer than feeding on the word of God. You will not win. You will go down in flames. You will be a victim without putting God's worth in your mouth, chewing on it, meditating on it, digesting it, making it a part of your fiber and your being. Now, I know there's some people, and I'm one of them, that doesn't memorize things well. So do the best you can. But you have no excuse for not trying because it's a command. You are to do it. You need to know what God says and get it in your heart and observe to do it. Do it. Right? And if you do these things, you will have victory. This is strategy on the battlefield. Get your orders. Get your marching orders and follow them. Next, in Joshua chapter 5, I love this. So God is bringing the people of Israel into the promised land. He's parted the waters. They've crossed the Jordan River miraculously. They're now about to come in and start conquering all that God has promised them. Wherever the sole of their foot would tread, it's already yours. I have given it to you. Go in and get it. And so as they start to camp, remember we talked about camp last night. That's what we're doing now. We're camping. 
were coming together to prepare to do battle. And God brings them to camp at a place called Gilgal, right on the other side of the Jordan River. From Gilgal, you can see Jericho, their first target, a fortified city. And God says, okay, here's the battlefield tactic. Here's the strategy. He says in Joshua 5, So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of uh, Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. When you march under the banner of God, people will fear you. People will know. I know the story of God. These guys are serious. Verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, and this is his battlefield strategy, make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the sons of Israel the second time. All those that had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, they hadn't done any of these circumcisions. So all the people that were to go to war, men 20 and above, able to hold the sword, and this included 30, 40, 50 Us guys, right? So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of foreskins. (laughs) Not a pretty picture. So God's battle strategy, okay, here you are, I brought you to the promised land, you're marching under my banner, you're a good old team, you're owning the promises, you understand the battle plan, you're putting it into action, first thing team, whoosh. and so what are we doing? We're about to go attack and we're walking around bow-legged. That's not what I would consider awesome battle posture. But it doesn't matter what I consider because God considers it awesome battle posture. Gentlemen, if you're having problems with the flesh, there is no solution for it but to cut it off. If you're being dogged by these passions and desires and lusts, And yeah, it can be of a sexual nature, but it can be of all different kinds of things. There's all kinds of addictions out there. (laughs) Want me to step on a couple toes for y'all? How about caffeine? You know that's a... (laughs) You do understand that is a drug. Okay? And if you can't get up in the morning and be nice to your spouse, you might need to go to battle on that one. Should you have any drug that is controlling you? Or you should be on top of it, right? Sin lies crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Right? Food. Ouch. (laughs) Food, food's good. Food's a good thing, yeah. In moderation. Diet. Exercise. Sleep? Are we here at camp to do war, gentlemen? Or are you coming to a retreat where I'll make you feel happy? If we want to win this battle, we've got to get serious. We've got to make no provision for the flesh or the lusts thereof. This is battle posture. Be sure of that. We go on in chapter 5. We get to verse 13, and we read, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversary? So he said, No. What kind of answer is that? (laughs) No, but as commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. As if you hadn't been broken down enough, now you're barefoot. You've got to be real, gentlemen. You've got to be humble. You've got to be transparent. You've got to be teachable. 
And you have to recognize whose side you're on and whose banner you fight under. Joshua's question is what side you're on. This is a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ himself. Joshua worships him. He doesn't rebuke the worship. He receives it because he is Jesus Christ, the commander of the army of the Lord. And when we come before our Lord and Savior, the only posture is barefoot, humble and real. You're not going to win this battle if you don't get real. And it can't win the battle if we don't enter into the war in worship. I love the story that we read in Chronicles of Jehoshaphat. He gets news that he's being attacked from the Moabites and the Edomites. And they're coming up the hill and they're, they're going to wipe them out. There's so many of them. And they go to the Lord in sackcloth and ashes. And they bring their complaints before the Lord. And the Lord rises up a prophet. And the prophet says to Jehoshaphat, you know what you need to do? You need to go to that canyon where they're coming up to attack you. And you're going to go out that morning. And you're going to take the worship team, the praise band. And you're going to line the rim. And we're all going to follow the praise team, and they're going to sing songs to the Lord and worship God. And then God says, while you stand along the rim of that canyon and watch those armies come up, I'm going to throw them into confusion. They're going to wipe each other out. There's going to be so much booty. There's going to be so many spoils from that. It's going to take you a week just to haul it back home. But where does it start? Worship. Send in the worship team. Gentlemen, do you not understand that when we get worship leaders up here, they're the front line of the army? Worship is not option. It's not the warm-up act until we get into the real stuff. That is the real stuff. And if you go into the camp of the enemy with some kind of sour, down attitude, a loser attitude, weak and, 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 and worn out, man, you're just asking for it. Do you guys sing? I heard you sing. I sing in my car. I don't have a radio. So it's me and the Lord and I sing. I'm not a great singer. I already told the story about Daryl and I in the Philippines, and that was a train wreck. <laughs> in my church, occasionally, I'm called upon to sing solo. So low that nobody else can hear me. <laughs> but I sing. God has given me breath, and I sing. Because that is the strategy that overcomes the enemy. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of Israel. And so this is strategy for the battlefield. We take off our sandals. We worship the Lord. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving and praise. Amen? So, going on with Joshua, chapter 6. It just gets better all the time. In chapter 6, we meet Joshua. Now they've come to Jericho, the fortified city. And as they come to Jericho, God gives them more battlefield strategy. We read in verse 1, Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, none went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. Now, I know you're reading the Bible and you just kind of take it at face value. It says what it says, so believe it. But here they are. They're between the Jordan River on their backside, no retreat, walking up to the gates of Jericho, and it's a fortified city. It's shut up, and no one can get in. And God says, see, I've given it to you. I'm not seeing anything, God. It looks to me like a fortified city, and no one can get in. And it's the same as we storm the gates of hell. You think, you know what, there's no way in. There's no way I can get Back that which was ripped off from me. There's no way that I can have victory over my enemy. The defenses are too strong. They're too powerful. So God says, okay, this is what we're going to do. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people will shout with a great shout, and then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. What is that? 
That's not the way I thought I should go in. That's not the way the world goes in. That's not the way that I have been taught to go in, battling head on, fists up, you know, scowling and, and screaming. And this is a completely different strategy. You're going to take seven days and you're going to walk around that city. You're going to observe that city. You're going to understand what's going on in that city. And just in doing that, you're going to strike fear into the heart of that city. And when God says it's time, we need to be listening to God. We need to be walking in the spirit. We need to be following his directions. We need to have the playbook in our hearts. We need to know who it is that we're fighting for. And as a team, we go together and we listen. And when God says shout, shout. Do it. Do it. And if God is saying shout right now to you today, you've come to this place for such a time as this. The book of Esther, Mordecai says to her, you know what, all the Jews are getting wiped out unless you go in and see the king. But if I go in and see the king, it's a death threat unless he lifts up the golden scepter to me. Just know this, Esther. You don't go in, you're going to die. That's already been taken off the table. You have nothing to lose, gentlemen. If you don't go in and get back that which Satan stole from you, if you don't get control of your life and have victory over sin and rule over it, that's already been taken from you. But if you don't, you know, you do know the wages of sin is death every time. We really don't have an option, do we? We need to go in. And if this is that time, if God says shout today, here, man, you get with a brother, you get with a group of people. I know Gerald's heart is to see this conqueror's ministry flourish in this fellowship. Get with these men. Get into the battle and take victory. Follow up. Is God talking to your heart right now? We keep on going. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Yeah, they were supposed to go in and conquer, but they were not supposed to take back any of the, the gold and silver, but Achan did. He disobeyed a direct command from the commander-in-chief. And because of this, there was sin in the camp. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let oh, about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Sebarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. And he and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To deliver us into the hand of the Ammonites or Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns it back before the enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? There's sin in the camp. You presumed to go up. You didn't go in full battle armor. You only took part of the team. You didn't give it your all. You gave it some. And they beat up on you. Anybody here know that feeling? I want to kick this thing. I need to get this out of my life. But I want to save just a little bit for me. That accursed thing. Just to, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to, like, do it all the time. But I just want to at least have one beer in the back of the fridge. 
I'm not saying that alcohol is a sin, but it surely has destroyed thousands and thousands of lives. We could go through this room and hear testimony all day long of the lives that it's destroyed. And there should be no provision. And there should be no accursed thing. If you know this thing isn't good for you, knock it off. Knock it off. Right? Where is it in the Bible say, thou shall not smoke? It's not in there. But it might be in here. If God tells you, you know what you're doing? That's a dirty, filthy habit. It's going to shorten your lifespan. You're not going to be there for your wife, your kids, and your grandkids. You're going to live life half alive. It's going to destroy you physically, wear you down. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm preaching against smoking here. Maybe that's something God spoke into my life. But gentlemen, if God speaks it into your life, it is a cursed thing. It is your accursed thing. And you need to go at it full strength. Cold turkey sometimes they would say or whatever. But you need to throw everything there is against it. And they lost. They didn't. And then Joshua's lying on his face, covering his head with ashes, wailing to the Lord. Oh, I wish we'd never come in here. God, what's the big idea? Why didn't you just leave us on the other side? You bring us here to die. What's God's answer? Get up. Get up. Why are you lying on your face? Did I cause this? Did you ever consult me about how you should do this? Did you ever pray to me? Did you ever get the elders together and say, how are we going to take AI? You didn't do any of that. You went in in your own power. And this one's on you. Get up. How many times do we whine about, oh, this and that in my life? Oh, the devil, or all that, or this temptation or that. Listen, if you can't stand the temptation, kill your computer. What are you doing with a computer if you don't have that kind of control? Oh, but in this day and age, you don't understand, Mike. I got to have my, my this and my that. And you know, it's important. It's my job. Okay, my job, my life. My computer, my wife. Really? It's that hard of a decision for you? Let me tell you, brother, you got a problem if you can't sort that one out. Okay? Keep moving on. Joshua 8, 9. Joshua therefore sent them out, and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai, but Joshua lodged the night among the people. I just picked that one out because when they did consult God as to how we're going to conquer Ai, this little teeny problem compared to the big Jericho, God says, okay, I'll give you a plan. He asked, God delivered. Any of you lacks wisdom? Ask, God will freely give it to you. What do I need to do in this thing? And then when he tells you, do it. And what did God say? I'm going to set up an ambush. We're going to go around the back side. We're going to start a fire on the front side. They're going to come running out. When they run out, you go in and clobber them. Wow, brilliant, right? This is taught in war schools nowadays. It's a wonderful tactic. But God understands how that. And we need to follow God's plan and follow him. But he set up an ambush. And I just would say this for the rest of us. You need accountability. You need to set up ambushes in your life for those things that are coming to take you down. You need to put controls on your media. You need to have brothers that you can be accountable to. You need to have people speaking into your life that know what you're doing. You need to be transparent with people. You know that the enemy has no power over you if you freely confess and make transparent all the issues that you're dealing with in your life. There's no weapon he can use against you when it's no longer a secret. But it's a secret. He just keeps beating you with it, poking with you, and you can't do anything about it because it's a secret. Get it out there. Get some controls. Get some ambush going on in your life, and he won't be able to use that against you anymore. You've just taken the weapon right out of his hand. Kind of wanted to wrap this up. Go into chapter 9. At verse 3, we, be, we read, But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho 
in AI. They worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys and old wineskins and tore and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet and old garments on themselves. And all the bread and their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. Compromise. God had told them, all the people of the land, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the termites, the, all these things that are decaying you from inside, chewing you to pieces, you wipe them all out. Well, the devil's not a fool. Well, he is a fool. No, he is not a fool. He believes there's a God. But he's an idiot. But <laughs> you know what idiot means. It comes from the word id. He's self-focused. That was his original downfall, self-pride. So when I say the devil is an idiot, I'm not throwing a reviling accusation. I'm just stating the truth. Okay, but he does know how to work you. He does know how to get you to compromise, to slide. He shows up as an angel in light. He speaks with smooth words. He's beguiling. He's that serpent that just whispers in your ear. Did God really say? And we find ourselves, instead of going to God and saying, what What is this, God? What am I supposed to do with this issue in my life? All these things come into your life, and you kind of compromise and slide. That's really not that bad. Those are fatal words. It's either bad or it's good. There is not that bad. Bad is bad. You cross a line, it's bad. And you can't make compromise. So we go to chapter 10. And in chapter 10 at verse 6, I'm just going to pick up a little vignette. And the men of Gibeon, these people who had deceived the children of Israel and had made a covenant and caused Israel to compromise the word of God, The men of Gideon sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. Now all the other bad guys, they were mad at the Gibeonites because they were crafty. They got a deal. They weren't going to get wiped out, so they turned on them. And so now the Gibeonites are in hot water, and so who do they reach out to? Joshua and the children of Israel. Why? Because they had made a covenant. They had made a vow. And they know that God expects us to honor our vows. Gentlemen, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Cut and dried. We don't need to swear in the name of anything. We just stand firm in the truth. But these guys compromised, and now they've got to honor this vow. And it says in verse 7, So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war, with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them. Man, it seems like we always hear that. Do not fear them. Why do you think God keep, keeps telling us that? Because we do. We, we fear. Do you know what fear is? It's a lack of faith. Do you believe God? Do you believe the promises of God? Do you trust God? Because if you do, it, it will wipe fear out of your life. Now, I'm not saying that to minimize fear. It's real. I get fears. I mean, I, I, get, I get nervous before I come up here to preach. I'm a basket case. Standing in the pulpit, preaching the word of God, you think that's something a person should take lightly? It's scary. I don't want to dishonor God. I don't want to disrespect him, and I know All kinds of stupid things come out of my mouth that I have to try to walk back later on. Last uh, Sunday I was in church. We're teaching in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about the marriage relationship and the women and the men and everything. And I was saying, gentlemen, do you understand that if there's any problem in your marriage, it's your responsibility? If there's any issue in your family, it's your responsibility. If you're having problems at work, it's your responsibility The Bible clearly lays it out in the book of Ephesians. This is your job, gentlemen. You have been given a position of responsibility and authority, and you need to step into it. And if your wife isn't happy, it's because it's your your issue. You've got to do something with it. 
And, and I was talking, and I, I mentioned something like, well, you know, some guy might come to me and go, well, yeah, but you don't know my wife. <laughs> and I, as brilliant as I am, said, well, I don't need to know your wife. I've got one of my own. <laughs> You're doing exactly what they did to me at church. <laughs> this one's going down in infamy. It's going to be written in the history books, and I'll probably never get past it. But my point was not my wife versus your wife. My point was your responsibility, my responsibility. It really doesn't matter whose issue it is or what the issue is, let's say that. It doesn't matter. It's my responsibility. That's the point. So Joshua goes to battle. For the Gibeonites, do not fear, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horan, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened. As they fled before Israel. Now who's doing the fighting here? Who's whooping up? It says the Lord killed them. Right? All Joshua had to do was man up, take his responsibility, honor his vow, accept his role, and he says he went all night to get into this battle. And the Lord shows up and does the work. Right? Right? We just have to know, we've got to step up and do what the Lord puts on our plate and let the Lord do what the Lord does real good. And in this battle, you do understand this battle of life, this battle of the Christian walk, walking worthy of the calling, honoring God with our lives, with our minds, with our heart, with our soul, with our, all that we are, our being, our actions, our activities, all of that. That's a battle. That's a fight that we wage. And God gives us a mind. God gives us a body because he expects us to use it. But we use it to his glory and to his good pleasure. And it's his good pleasure to show up and say, now let me show you what I can do. And God can take whatever it is that might be your issue or issues and whoop on it, kill them. Wipe them all out. God can do this. Gentlemen, you do need to know. Gerald had mentioned with this program that we're going to be watching this afternoon, 90% success. I talked last night. 60 to 70% of men have an issue with some kind of a sexual addiction. If you look around the room, you can reach out your hand and you're probably touching somebody that's got that issue. And in most cases, looking at the large... The large percentage, that's actually most of us in some way or another, okay? But you have, there's victory. There's victory available for us, gentlemen. Do you want victory? Do you want to poke your finger in the eye of the enemy? Do you want to storm hell and get back what's been stolen from you? Do you want to stand up as a church and be a light and salt in this world, a representative of Jesus Christ here in Yucca Valley, the Morongo Basin, and to the ends of the earth? Do you want to see God move mightily in this fellowship? Then we need to take responsibility, step up and do what we're doing, and then God will move, okay? We've watched that here in this fellowship for how many decades is it now? It's in 40 years God has been working in Yucca Valley. Right? I mean, isn't that all, all, that's a God story right there. And yet, this fellowship is known globally. That's just an amazing thing. Why? Because it has a legacy of men. One of the things we're blessed by, we're so close to the Marine base. You know, and, and, and we're just rich with men in this. Look at the men here today. Rich with men that say, I want to make my life count for something. I want to be a soldier for Jesus Christ. I want to be a light in the world. I want to go out and share that good news, that grace that washed over me, that set me free. Hallelujah. I want to be used by God. And because of that, God looks and he says, okay, I can use a church in Yucca Valley. I get that done. 
And he goes out, and look what he does. It happened as they fled before Israel, and they were on the descent of Beth Horan, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven as far as from Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. I'd love to get the DVD on that. I know I'm not supposed to watch those kind of movies, but man, this is biblical, okay? Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Gentlemen, we need to get in this battle. We need to let the Lord fight for us. We need to humble ourselves. We need to make no provision for the flesh. We may understand that we are Fighting under the banner of victory, Jehovah Nisei. We are a team. We are going at this together. We're going to honor our vows. We're going to walk in purity and unity and love and light and hope and wisdom in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see walls fall down. And we're going to search and see, is there any wicked way in me? And we're going to ask God to do surgery on our heart. And as God speaks into our heart and says, that's your issue, we're going to shout. We're going to man up and say, that's it. I'm taking battle. We're going to gather men together and we're going to get the job done. And we're going to see that when we do all of that, God is going to extend the day. He's going to give you everything you need to get it done to the uttermost. I stand here today in testimony of the things that God has done in my life. You heard my testimony last night. I was a dirtbag, a lowlife, a loser, a bum, a climbing dude, living in a tent out of Joshua Tree. And God took a person like me and delivered me out of all kinds of stuff. Am I done? No. Not that I've already attained. But this one thing I do Taking all those things that are behind me, I'm setting my sights forward. I'm pressing on, right? I'm looking after that upward call, that prize of Christ Jesus and God. Amen? Amen. 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 Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for Joshua, and I want to thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we learn as we go out on the battlefield, how we can be victorious in you. How we can be victorious through you and your great grace in our life. Through worship and humility, Lord. In purity and purpose of heart. In faithful obedience to your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've not left us. But that, Lord, you've gone before us. And you have won the victory. It's done. It's only for us to just go in and everywhere the sole of our foot stomps. Take it back in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's stand.